Hi, my name is Heather Gregg. This is my presentation on the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. In this presentation, I will discuss where the neurotransmitter is found in the brain, the neuropathways and receptors it uses, how an excess or deficiency in the neurotransmitter can contribute to psychiatric illness, list some specific disorders that the neurotransmitter um, can create, and then provide you with some scholarly references that I used. The location of this neurotransmitter, according to our text, Kaplan and Sadox, can be found in the brain, more specifically in the medulla and the pons. The two-minute neuro video on norepinephrine more specifically locates the locus cerellus as the main site of production and that it can also be found in the sympathetic ganglion cells, which are near the spinal cord and released as a hormone by the adrenal glands. This image that I have on the screen um, gives a nice representation of where the pons are located at in the brain, where the medulla is in the brain. It highlights the locus cerellus and shows you also where the spinal cord is. The next topic that we'll be discussing is the pathway that this receptor or this neurotransmitter takes. So the life cycle of norepinephrine starts within a neuron and it needs to be a neuron that is tasked to make norepinephrine. An example of this would be a post-ganglion sympathetic neuron. With the active transport, tricine, tricine moves into this catecholamine secreting neuron, cytoplasm. Tricine is then converted by tricin hydroxylase into dopa. Dopa is then converted by decarboxylase into dopamine. Next, dopamine is actively transported into the vesicle by a vesicle monoamine transporter, also known as a VMAP. The vesicle is now filled with dopamine. And if the neuron's job was simply to secrete dopamine, the transaction would be done. However, since we are talking about a post-ganglionic sympathetic neuron, we want to make norepinephrine. So the life cycle of norepinephrine is that dopamine is then converted by dopa beta hydroxylase into norepinephrine. At this point, the norepinephrine is stored in the terminals and it's released into the postsynaptic cleft when an action potential depolarizes the membrane and calcium flows into the vesicle. Calcium interacts with the vesicle, causing them to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and it releases the norepinephrine into the synaptic cleft. Norepinephrine only remains active for a few seconds and has a rapid reuptake and diffusion. It reacts with the receptor, the adrenetic receptor, and we have um, a few types of those. There is an alpha adrenergic receptor. Alpha 1 controls our pupils, our vascular constriction, and our GI and GU sphincters. Alpha 2 is the norepinephrine nerve terminals and the brain. Then we have beta adrenergic receptors. Beta 1 is for the heart. Beta 2 is for the lungs. Once the um, norepinephrine has the contact with those beta adrenergic receptors, it then uses it and then it releases it back into the synaptic cleft. When it gets released back into the synaptic cleft, three things can occur to remove it. It can either be reuptake into the adrenergic nerve ending via the nerve norepinephrine transporter, which is the net. And that's about 50, 50 to 80 percent of the norepinephrine is taken back into the vesicle by the VMAP. And it's almost like a recycling program. So again, the receptor releases it. It's into the synaptic cleft. It gets back into the cytoplasm with the net. And then the VMAP recycles it back into the vesicle. The second action could be it diffuses away from the synaptic cleft and goes into the bloodstream. 
And the third would be that it's brought back into the cytoplasm by the net, trans, the net, which is the norepinephrine transporter, and it's broken down by enzymes and created into inactive metabolites. And the enzyme that would most likely do this is the monoamine oxidase. So now that we know the life cycle, we have to think, well, how can norepinephrine contribute to illness? And we can examine it by what norepinephrine does in your body. So the generalized body gets increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. It triggers glucose to be used as energy. It increases blood flow to your skeletal muscles. It reduces blood flow to your GI system, which reduces motility. And it also inhibits voiding. None of that really would contribute necessarily to a mental health illness or a psychiatric illness. However, what it does in the brain can. So when it's in the brain, it increases your arousal and your alertness. It promotes vigilance and enhances memory and attention. Too much of it will make you a little restless and a little anxious. And too little of it's going to make you um, have reduced alertness, have memory and attention issues. So when we look at um, specific disorders that can be caused by it, if we have low levels, it's associated with depression, schizophrenia, and Parkinson, and then high levels would be related to anxiety. And my references for this video are listed here. Thank you for watching.